All right. So I think Dr. Zacharias, unfortunately, had to um, have to step out. Uh, so I'll be carrying the presentation um, by myself. So uh, thanks for everyone. Thanks, everyone uh, who's able to uh, to join. And again, um, sorry about the technical difficulties. So let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. Uh, it is the therapeutic applications of uh, medical cannabis with particular interest um, in chronic pain. So that's going to be the main focus for today. Uh, there is nothing to disclose at the moment. So this is just a general outline where uh, we're going to be discussing acute versus chronic pain, um, then go on to sort of talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, uh, certain major cannabinoids, um, as well as talk about therapeutic applications, how we can apply these uh, concepts therapeutic, uh, therapeutically, as well as potential drug interactions with uh, cannabis. Okay, so let's go ahead and first just get a general refresher of acute versus chronic pain. We know with acute pain, it can result through multiple different ways, either fractures, soft in tissue injury, surgery, um, that could either lead to bone or tissue damage or peripheral nerve damage, or even in some cases, dysfunction, uh, leading to pro-inflammatory cytokines. And what that does is that it can increase the activity of primary nociceptive neurons. So in this acute pain uh, setting over here, generally our body resolves it through the production of certain um, inflammatory molecules, certain um, endogenous uh, endocannabinoids, or even endogenous opioids to sort of deal with this issue over here. And then we know when it comes uh, within the context of chronic pain, it's a lot more complicated. We have this vicious cycle over here where there's this um, maladaptive changes in the brain. So cortical reorganization in regions of the brain, we dub that neuroplasticity. That leads to persistent activity of these primary nociceptive neurons leading to peripheral sensitization. You get more production of these um, inflammatory neuropeptides like substance P. Um, and in some cases you can get neurogenic inflammation in um, certain diseases like CRPS. So you have this vicious cycle and it keeps happening long enough, you get central sensitization um, and that is generally uh, shown as allodynia or hyperalgesia. Now, talking a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, what it is, uh, just again, um, a very quick refresher. It's a system composed of certain neurotransmitters um, that bind to their own specific or respect, um, respective receptors. Um, they exert a multitude of effects, um, and these effects are involved in the modulation of pain pathways. It can also be involved in modulation of stress, sleep, learning, and memory, as well as emotional processing. We have CB1 receptors mainly found in the central nervous system over here, and the endocannabinoid that it particularly binds to is 2-AG and anandamide. And in with regards to chronic pain or with regards to pain in general, it is able to sort of negatively regulate the neurotransmission um, of, of these pathways. On the other hand, we have CB2 receptors, which are generally found um, all over the body, uh, mainly in immune cells. They bind to 2-AG and they can sort of regulate the activity of the um, immune cells that are found in the central nervous system and elsewhere as well. Now, in the presence or when we don't have any cannabinoids to deal with this large influx of um, hormones being released at the uh, synaptic level over here, you get this the, you know, overproduction of acetylcholine, uh, you get dopaminergic, glutaminergic, um, or even norgenergic signals. Um, and that you know, is associated with signals such as pain, mood, hunger, and sleep. In the presence of cannabinoids, you get a, a dampening down of this response as well, right? So cannabinoids that bind to the CB1 receptor at the level of the central nervous system, it can downregulate neurotransmission of pain cells. Um, whereas cannabinoids that bind to the CB2 receptor in the immune cells, it can sort of regulate the production of the inflammatory response. Now, where does medical cannabis fit in? So we've kind of talked about acute pain and how there is this, um, uh, how the body generally deals with acute pain through the production of um, endocannabinoids, endogenous opioids. Now, when it comes to chronic pain, uh, this activity is sort of dysregulated. Um, so when with chronic pain, there is this theory dubbed the endocannabinoid uh, dysfunction theory, where the endocannabinoid system doesn't really function very, very well. So if we sort of um, supplement with exogenous cannabinoids that, for instance, come from pharmaceutical cannabinoids or phytocannabinoids, which is basically plant-based cannabinoids, um, we can sort of re-establish this balance that's uh, that's lost. 
Okay, so now let's sort of discuss the major cannabinoids that are involved. And uh, medical cannabis, for the purposes of this presentation, comes in in many forms. So, for instance, there is the phytocannabinoids or plant-based um, cannabinoids, um, and those are generally uh, ones that are extracted from the cannabis plant, and they come in various forms. Um, they can come in oils, capsules, dried extracts. And on the other hand, you have pharmaceutical cannabinoids. So those are the ones that are actually made in pharmaceutical grade labs um, under stringent requirements. Um, the difference between the two is, uh, unfortunately, with phytocannabinoids, it's um, unregulated industry. So you can get poor quality control, whereas pharmaceutical cannabinoids, of course, um, is a regulated industry, so you can get a lot more consistency in quality control as well as dosing. But generally, when we talk about medical cannabis, we always um, include phytocannabinoids as well as pharmaceutical cannabinoids. Now, when we look at specific uh, or the major cannabinoids involved, of course, one of the most common ones is tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. THC actually comes in two different forms. There's delta-9 THC as well as this decarboxylated form over here called delta-8 THC. Um, THC is actually or labeled as the psychoactive cannabinoid because it mainly binds to its main receptor, the CB1, which we talked about found mostly in the central nervous system. And it can exert uh, a multitude of psychoactive effects that can alter mood, balance, senses, as well as behavior. Um, it is dopaminergic, so it can increase dopamine release, and this is where the reinforcing properties and the euphoria come into play, but it does have clinical effects. So it can modulate pain signals, it can increase somnolence, as well as uh, reduce anxiety. Delta-8 THC, on the other hand, is kind of a less psychoactive form um, of THC. It too can also bind to CB1 receptor, and um, it's hypothesized that the antiemetic properties um, is, is where it comes from. So the antiemetic properties of THC generally comes from delta-8 THC. Now, cannabidiol or CBD is one that's gained a lot of attention uh, recently. It's dubbed as the non-psychoactive um, or the medicinal cannabinoid, although we don't really agree with this because we've just seen that THC can also have clinical effects or medicinal effects. But nevertheless, that's how it's kind of um, associated with or what it's associated with. It can also act on the brain to sort of modulate the psycho effect or the psychoactive effects of THC through negative allosteric modulation. And we'll discuss what we mean by that in the next slide. CBD can actually bind to uh, a multitude of other receptors as well, like serotonin and dopamine. And generally it plays a role as well in, in modulating pain signals. And it can also, or has been shown to reduce inflammation. CBN is also uh, another cannabinoid that is relatively studied. Um, it is a metabolite of delta-9 THC. So when we consume T THC, our body breaks it down, can form CBN. And there are some studies that show that it can possess immunosuppressive properties. Now, what do we mean by negative allosteric modulation? As you can see over here, THC doesn't really fit very well into the active site of the CB1 receptor. So with negative allosteric modulation through CBD, you can get um, this event that happens over here where THC doesn't properly bind um, or doesn't bind to the CB1 receptor at all, or it's not able to fit um, through modulation of the active site over here. And this ultimately, uh, what it means um, in a clinical perspective is that it results in a decrease effects of THC. So if we're worried about adverse effects that um, can arise from THC, incorporating CBD generally um, helps in that regard. On the other hand, there's also positive allosteric modulators. So what it can do is that it can actually enhance the effects of THC. And there's a lot of studies going on into which compounds actually do that. Currently, it's hypothesized that flavonoids or terpenoids, um, which are the compounds that give the um, specific plant its uh, specific aroma or taste, it can actually um, increase the effects of THC. So just for your understanding, there is negative allosteric modulators as well as positive ones. Now, other cannabinoids that are not very well studied compared to CBD or THC is uh, this one over here, CBG, for instance. It's, again, as I've mentioned, not very well studied. Um, it is hypothesized that it can help with inflammation, nerve pain, um, reducing appetite. But again, these claims are not substantiated, as well as CBC, um, where the role is not entirely elucidated as well. But just for your appreciation, you need to know that there's over about 500 um, both active and inactive chemicals in the cannabis plant. 
about 100 of, 100 of them are actually active. So it does have some sort of clinical effect in the body. But the two that are mostly studied is THC and CBD. So why is this sort of important uh, from a therapeutic perspective is because and it sort of ties into the poor quality control that is found in um, the medical cannabis industry is that other active cannabinoids that may be present in some products are not accounted for. So this can lead into a problem with um, inconsistency between products. And this is why it's very hard to sort of find um, kind of a standard uh, dose when it comes to uh, phytocannabinoids or plant-based cannabinoids. Okay, so discussing therapeutic applications, let's begin with pharmaceutical cannabinoids. Now, as I've mentioned, pharmaceutical cannabinoids are those that are made by pharmaceutical companies under stringent requirements. Uh, they have to gain uh, regulatory approval, uh, and these compounds are nabilone, brand name Sesamet, as well as uh, Nabiximols or Sativex. Now, nabilone, in terms of chronic pain, is actually used off-label. Um, it's indicated for third-line, was a third-line therapy for um, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. It is sort of a THC mimetic, so it, it acts or uh, it mimics THC. So generally speaking, we are sort of worried about uh, the adverse effects that may arrive from, from nabilone. So we can assume that there could be psychoactive effects if we take nabilone, just like how we take uh, plant-based THC. So generally, if we're going to dose it, we always have to sort of um, take on a start low, go slow approach. So usually lowest dose available would be 0.5 milligrams at bedtime. That is generally a dose that is covered by public drug plans. There is a lower dose of 0.25 milligram capsules. However, this dose isn't covered by a uh, public drug plan. So that's just um, something out of interest over here. The onset is fairly quickly, about one to two hours, and the duration can last fairly long, eight to 12 hours as well. It can produce active metabolites, so it can even be a little bit longer than that um, based on whether the patient can tolerate abalone or has prior exposure to it uh, or not. And if we are going to titrate, you want to do so slowly by 0.5 milligrams every week. Uh, and of course, you adjust that based on response and tolerability to a max generally of one milligrams twice a day. Now, if you were to look at the product monograph or nabalone, you can actually, the max dose is listed as six milligrams, but that's generally for a different indication for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Now, Sativex is actually a pharmaceutical grade of a uh, roughly a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD and THC, and it comes in a form of an oral mucosal spray. Um, generally, we don't normally use it very much in chronic pain simply because it's very, very expensive. It's hard to dose, so it requires priming, and that can lead to sort of um, dosing errors, or it makes it complicated for the patient. And it's also not readily covered by public drug plans as well. The onset, peak, and duration is very similar to nabilone. And generally with titration, you also want to sort of start at a very low dose and go up slowly, generally to a max dose of 12 sprays per day. There are other pharmaceutical cannabinoids like Marinol and Epidiolex. However, those are not available in Canada. Um, Marinol was taken off the market in 2012. Um, Epidiolex was actually recently uh, approved. Uh, late last year in 2023, but it's not readily available. Okay, so how do we dose phytocannabinoids? Now, the dosing of phytocannabinoids is very, very interesting. Generally, with phytocannabinoids, it comes in a ratio, it's almost written as a ratio, it's almost always written as a ratio of CBD to THC. And that's because, as I've mentioned before, those are the cannabinoids that are uh, most studied, right? So you can get products that are CBD dominant. You can get other products that are more of a balanced as well as you can get products that are THC dominant and they come in a, a wide range of products over here, right? So we have oil uh, extracts, you have dried flour, uh, which is usually presented as a concentration of a percent per gram. You have edible products, creams, or mucosal uh, spray. Now, the problem with dosing phytocannabinoids is that they're are no validated dosage requirements, right? And this is due to the fact that there is a high level of variability surrounding these products. Um, and that again, stems or ties into the fact that it's an unregulated industry and that there's a lot of poor, poor quality control, but there's also user or patient related factors. So there's genetic differences in cannabinoid receptors, there's differences in metabolism, prior exposure um, or tolerance. So all of that can lead to um, 
clinical effects or clinical differences in how cannabis uh, sort of, uh, or how patient can um, interact with cannabis or how they can experience cannabis. So the solution generally, because there's this wide variability surrounding these products, we always err on the side of caution and we always wanna take on a start low and go slow approach for most of these products that are that you see over here. So generally speaking, if you're interested in numbers, most studies or some studies actually use doses as low as 2.5 milligrams of THC with effect. So they, they found benefit in certain um, pain conditions like neuropathic pain. So we could extrapolate this to CBD. And so therefore, when we start at a dose of either two milligrams of THC or CBD, we can then titrate it up slowly and individualize um, the titration based on the response and tolerability. So that's generally every three to seven days or so. Um, and if we want to sort of uh, find out how much medical cannabis we can allocate to our patients uh, based on past um, major databases, most patients that used cannabis for medical purposes um, average out through uh, a use of one to three grams per day. So using these numbers in mind, we can actually formulate our own specific guidelines specifically for cannabis naive patients. So we can start the patient off by providing them a medical document that allows them for one gram of cannabis per day. Primarily, we can educate them about choosing a product that is CBD dominant, right, in order to sort of avoid the psychoactive effects that um, may stem from THC, because if they can fare well on a product that is CBD dominant in sort of treating or managing their pain, then that way we've sort of bypassed all the issues that arise from, from THC. In terms of a formulation, we want to focus on products that are generally oral based or ingested extracts as opposed to inhalation. Um, in order to sort of minimize any respiratory effects that arise from inhalation. And a starter dose, as we've indicated before, we can initiate them at a dose of two milligrams of CBD or THC, depending on what you're trying to treat. And we can sort of titrate um, accordingly. But generally, we like to start with CBD, as I've mentioned before. Um, and then when it comes to titration, we can use a dose of about 40 milligrams per day of CBD in order to sort of um, sort of as a target to gauge whether uh, the therapy is going to be effective or not. So if they've titrated themselves all the way to a dose of 40 milligrams of CBD and there's absolutely no difference in pain levels at all, then there's likely um, this is a result that this is uh, a failed product. However, if there's partial improvement, then that is a good indication that they may benefit from further dose escalation or, or dose increases. So if there's no benefit observed um, by using a product of up to 40 milligrams of CBD, this is when we can sort of move up the ladder over here and start utilizing products that um, have more THC in them. When we dose cannabis oil, uh, just as you see over here, uh, this is a visual representation that you can provide to your patients or you can sort of counsel your patients on. So essentially what it is, is you start at the lowest dose possible, 0.1 milliliters. Generally, that is even lower than what the manufacturer recommends. Um, and then we ask patients to increase every three to five days um, by another 0.1. You stop if they're getting good pain relief. Um, stop if they're getting side effects and then they can just go back to the previous dose and also stop if they're using up to two milliliters and it's not working. And we'll indicate why two milliliters later on in the presentation. When it also comes to cannabis oil, normally we tell patients to um, take it sublingually. That does increase bioavailability a little bit. And some patients don't find it palatable. So we tell them to mix it in a source of um, like something like pudding or anything that has um, a fatty substance in, in it. So a good concentration of CBD dominant product to start with is generally um, a CBD oil containing almost no THC and about 20 milligrams per mil. Why? Because if you use the right dose method over here, so if you start at 0.1 milliliter, and if you do the math, then that is generally going to give you the initial dose that we want, which is about two, millig two milligrams of CBD. Okay, and then as I've mentioned before, Counseling tips that are helpful for your patient, you can ask them to titrate the dose by another 0.1 milliliters every three days and monitor for any changes in pain. Generally, they do like to ask us when they expect to see some sort of benefit. 
It may take a while to go up to that target dose of 40 milligrams or so, uh, but generally we do find patients that benefit at around a dose of 10 to 20 milligrams of CBD, so about halfway uh, through the titration. And once they gauge the effect of the product um, in terms of you know any sort of adverse effects or anything of that sort, and if they feel comfortable taking it in the morning, then they can sort of um, split the dose or take it during the daytime. Again, so if a patient fails um, a CBD dominant product or a CBD dominant oil for the first time, uh, do we go into immediately adding a product that has a higher amount of THC? Generally what we like to do, and again, because of the poor quality control that is found in the medical cannabis industry, we want them to use another trial with a CBD dominant product from a different supplier or from a different company. And that stems, our, again, it ties into the fact that there may be active products in there that are not accounted for that resulted in the failure of that initial product. So it's almost always a good idea to sort of ask them or tell them to try another or give another uh, CBD dominant product trial before um, going into incorporating products that have uh, or have a higher amount of THC. So if they've used several CBD dominant products uh, from different companies, and, and again, without any benefit or any effect, then this would be a good indication that they may benefit from um, products that have a higher amount of THC. So you can see this product over here is about a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD. So whenever we incorporate or add a new product, we still use the same exact um, titration or the right dose method. So you start at the lowest dose possible, 0.1 milliliter, and then you titrate as accordingly over here. And it's very important to know that the greater the THC dose, the more risk of side effects that the patient might experience. Now, we get asked this question a lot, can we use products with different concentrations concurrently? Yes, I wouldn't suggest it though for someone who's cannabis naive, uh, more so for an experienced user. For instance, in this specific scenario, they would use their CBD dominant um, oil during the daytime. So half a milliliter, three times a day after meals. And the product that contains a little extra THC would be reserved for bedtime use. Now with dosing cannabis edibles or cap capsules, it's more or less the same approach where we started a very low dose generally of 2.5 milligrams of CBD. And then we ask the patient to titrate by another 2.5 milligrams every three days. Again, using the target 40 milligrams of CBD um, to gauge whether the product is going to be effective or not. And before switching to formulations that have higher amount of THC. Counseling tips to tell your patient that are using edibles or capsules is that Generally, try to find their dose by using whole edibles or, or capsules, because if they manipulate their edible by splitting or cutting them, it can lead to inaccurate dosing or dosing errors. Um, and then generally speaking, because through ingestion, the onset is generally delayed uh, about one hour or so, um, it's very important to tell them to wait at least one hour after the first dose to gauge the full effect. Now, therapeutic applications when it comes to routes of administration, as we've mentioned before, cannabis can be uh, sort of absorbed or retained through multiple different routes. Of course, there's inhalation routes, um, ingestion routes, and topical routes. Each one has very different pharmacokinetic profiles. Inhalation, of course, because it bypasses the first pass metabolism, has a very, very fast onset. So it starts working within 10 minutes, peaks in about 20 minutes, but can last up to four hours or so. For someone who's actually tolerant or has prior exposure, to cannabis, um, it can actually last a lot shorter than, than four hours. Uh, with ingestion routes, such as oils, capsules, or edibles, we know that it has to go through first pass metabolism. The bioavailability is significantly reduced, so up to 20% of the cannabinoid content actually reaches the bloodstream. It starts working within an hour, and it can last for up to six to eight hours or so. If we're worried about you know, polypharmacy or patients who are in a, taking a lot of other medications and we're worried about drug interactions, topical routes uh, is an option. However, um, topical routes may not be very practical, generally are expensive, and for specific pain conditions, it may not go deep enough to modulate pain pathways. 
Um, generally, in terms of evidence, um, it's it's very poor in comparison to other routes, and CBD may be more readily absorbed than THC again, but that's not a that claim is not substantiated. This is just another visual representation showcasing um, inhalation versus ingestion. We know with inhalation, it starts acting very, very quickly. You get this sudden peak, which puts the patient at risk of adverse effects, but then you get this um, sudden fall afterwards. So it doesn't last very long. Whereas with ingestion routes, you don't get that peak. So the, the risk of adverse effects is reduced, but then you also get that delayed release or sustained release. So for someone who's dealing with chronic pain and they would benefit from a sustained release medication, um, oral routes or ingestion routes are, are generally more favorable than inhalation in this case. Now, when we look at inhalation routes specifically, it can be attained through um, two different ways. So of course there's smoking and then there's vaporizing. Smoking of course can be through the use of joints, bongs, or pipes. The, the main difference between smoking and vaporizing is that when they're smoking cannabis, they are actually heating it up to 230 degrees or more, and that can lead to the production of toxic compounds. And it was for some reason widely thought that using bongs, it provides users with um, a cleaner smoke, but we know that the cannabis or the cannabinoid to tar ratio remains relatively the same. So this is not entirely uh, true. With vaporizing, what it does is that it regulates the temperature to about 170 to 230 degrees or more. And what that does is that it results in less formation of these toxic compounds. With vaporizing, it could either be through um, dried cannabis or through vaping liquid. Now, this is just a table showcasing the difference between cannabis smoke versus tobacco smoke. We already know how detrimental tobacco smoke is, but just to, you know, for context, cannabis smoke can actually have five times more level of carbon monoxide, three times more level of car, 20 times more ammonia. So definitely not, not very safe. And of course, puts uh, lung health at risk. So short-term repercussions would be chronic cough and bronchitis. Long-term effects would be COPD or lung cancer. So this is why it's generally not suggested to um, inhale or even smoke um, medical cannabis. So due to the less exposure of these toxic uh, chemicals, we know that vaping cannabis, of course, is a safer alternative if patients continue or want to um, inhale cannabis. However, uh, we know that vaping doesn't come without its own risks. So there is a condition called e Valley over here where they found that uh, it was identified in patients or people who vape very, very regularly. And this is a result of um, cutting agents or filler agents that was added specifically in vaping liquids, uh, which is why vaping or vaping dry cannabis is generally regarded as safer than vaping liquids. It's because with a lot of these vaping liquids, it would have things like vitamin E acetate that can adhere to lung tissue and can cause um, issues like, like popcorn lungs and things of that sort. Now, we've kind of talked about um, oils and soft gels when we're talking about dosing, uh, but generally speaking, uh, oils or cannabis oils are generally much more favorable um, in compared to soft gels, again, because um, they can start off at very, very low doses and titrate to you know, using very, very small increments as low as 0.1 milliliters. Whereas with soft gels, you can't really, you don't have that freedom to do so. If the soft gel comes in 2.5 milligrams, then you can only go up by 2.5 milligrams. And in some people that could be uh, kind of a significant jump or a big jump. Uh, and at that, in that case, they would have missed the, the appropriate dose or the right dose. With edible products, um, essentially what they are is cannabis oils, butters, or plant material, um, and then they're directly added into food. Generally, um, it comes in the form of uh, gummies or chewable products uh, or hard candies, baked, baked goods, things of that sort. There is not much variability when it comes to edible products. So if, you know, for patients who attain cannabis through a lot of these dispensaries or suppliers, it generally comes in three different doses of either CBD or THC, and those are either 2.5, 5 milligrams, and 10 milligrams. So in a nutshell, the, it is suggested to sort of take cannabis orally um, as opposed to inhalation, and that goes into why we recommend oral routes as opposed to um, inhalation routes when we're talking about choosing uh, the appropriate dose. 
And that's because, of course, it eliminates respiratory adverse effects. And in certain conditions like chronic pain, ingesting cannabis can last longer. Um, and that's uh, much more favorable for this demographic. And of course, the preferred method of ingesting cannabis is through the use of cannabis oils because you can um, dose it much more fairly uh, in comparison to edibles or, or capsules. In terms of adverse effects with um, medical cannabis, of course, most of the cannabis side effects are linked to THC. So you have cardiovascular issues um, such as tachycardia or rapid heart rate that's mostly driven by THC. The good thing is that it does subside after one week of use or so. Of course, you have extensive um, CNS side effects, gastrointestinal side effects, ophthalmologic, as well as psychiatric um, side effects. Serious um, or certain warnings and precautions to sort of um, to consider is cannabis-induced psychosis. We know that it can predispose users to future psychosis and mental illness, um, especially those under the age of 25. Um, even if they don't have any personal or family history of psychosis, this is generally something that you uh, want to uh, advise patients against if they're under the age of 25. Um, in terms of those who are generally predisposed for these conditions like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, you also would want to um, uh, would want to avoid uh, using any any cannabis products in that case. And of course, the risk is much greater with those that have um, a higher THC content. Uh, users with current or past substance use disorder, uh, that is generally something you want to caution them about. And of course, users who have unstable cardiovascular or respiratory disease, such as those who've just experienced a heart attack, of course, this is um, therapy with cannabis is, um, should be avoided. Now, when it comes to drug interactions, we know that cannabis is metabolized through the CYP450 enzyme pathway, along with many other medications. So the propensity of drug interactions is actually likely. Uh, CBD and THC are broken down into somewhat active metabolites as well, and generally they are mainly eliminated uh, fecally, whereas uh, about 25% is eliminated through, um, through the kidneys. Just, I want you to also look at the half-life of ingestion over here, which is about 41 to 132 hours because of the production of some of these active metabolites, hence why whenever we titrate the dose, we ask patient to wait or titrate every three to seven days, just given the fact that cannabis can adhere to certain tissues and it can still um, remain in the system well uh, after the last dose. Okay, this is just another slide to showcase the complexity of um, the cannabis metabolism. Um, some, some are inhibitors of the CYP304, 2D6 um, enzymes. Some are substrates of the CYP2C19, Right, So the propensity, again, for drug interactions um, is very, very likely. When we want to look at the specific metabolic pathway for CBD, and this is, of course, a very, very simplified example. So CBD generally is a substrate of CYP2C9 and 2C19, and it's converted to its active metabolite, um, 7-OH CBD. Uh, CBD as well in of itself is, is active, so both of these um, components are active as well. So when it comes to drug interactions, you can kind of appreciate that inhibitors of the CYP2C9 or the 2C19 will increase CBD levels, whereas inducers can actually decrease CBD levels. And this is just a, a table that's not exhaustive by any chance uh, that is showcasing the inhibitors as well as the inducers um, of CBD. Now, THC, on the other hand, has the same about of the uh, same enzymes that um, meta or uh, converted to the active metabolite. However, it also has that added component or the added enzyme CYP304. And we know that a lot of medications are inhibitors or inducers of the CYP304. So the propensity for drug interactions using THC is actually far greater than that of uh, CBD. Drug interactions could also occur in the form of additive effects rather than um, issues or interactions through the CYP enzyme pathway. So what we mean by additive effects, we know that cannabis can have psychoactive effects. It can in and of itself be a CNS depressant. So if you couple it with, or if it's used concurrently with other CNS depressants, you can get an increased effect of CNS depression. On the other hand, cannabis used concurrently with stimulants can cause additive tachycardia, especially uh, as we've seen um, products that have THC. 
as well as cannabis products that have anticholinergic or used concurrently with anticholinergic agents could either have additive tachycardia or even hypertensive effect as well. In the context of chronic pain, um, a lot of patients may be on opioids. Um, some of them may even be on anticonvulsants like pregabalin or, or gabapentin. Some of them may even be taking benzodiazepines. So it's very important to sort of do a drug interaction checks if you are going to um, uh, be adding medical cannabis as, as a therapy. In terms of future or potential drug interactions with psychedelics, we know that there is extensive research now being done um, or elucidating the role of psychedelics in treating um, a wide range of psychiatric conditions, right? So of course, users who are using medical cannabis and thinking of also using psychedelics, the propensity of drug interactions is very, very high. In this particular study, it, um, it followed patients, around 300 patients or so. Most of them were non-users, and then some of them were using cannabis at low, medium, as well as high doses, um, concurrently with, uh, with the psychedelic. And they found that with the concurrent use of cannabis with a lot of these psychedelics, it was associated with even a more intense psychedelic experience. Now, it is very important to note that many of these drug interactions are theoretical in nature, uh, but it may not necessarily have any sort of clinical relevance, right? So it's very important to sort of assess the clinical re relevance, seeing whether um, you know, it would be worthwhile to sort of add medical cannabis for your patients um, or not. So just because there is an interaction, it doesn't necessarily mean that therapy with medical cannabis is contraindicated. Um, it may simply mean that the dose of the cannabis needs to be further individualized um, in order to sort of mitigate the clinical effects um, of the drug interaction. This is uh, just an example of a study that was done here at the, at the pain clinic um, in showing you how to sort of assess clinical relevancy of drug interactions with cannabis. So it's just a case report of a 50-year-old female with bilateral breast carcinoma, and she was in remission, treated with tamoxifen. CBD was generally added at a dose, and she titrated her dose up to 40 milligrams daily. And that's because um, other analgesics were not appropriate in dealing with her post-surgical pain. And what we did is that the levels of active metabolites or tamoxifen were collected while on uh, CBD therapy and as well as after a 60-day washout. And what we found is that the levels of these active metabolites actually increased by roughly 19% following discontinuation. So this is an example of a, um, a clinically relevant drug interaction between cannabis and certain cancer medications in this case. So we know that tamoxifen uses CYP304 and CYP2D6 to, uh, to be converted into actually its active metabolite, indoxifen, which is needed for, uh, for the drug to be effective. We know CBD, as we've mentioned before, can inhibit both of these enzymes, and that can cause um, a significant reduction in indoxifen in this case. So after the washout, after 60 days, you had an increase of about 19%. So this is a case where monitoring would be required to identify whether there's going to be a subtherapeutic response um, with specific therapies. And in this particular case, because of the nature of disease and the medication, um, cannabis would not be sort of worthwhile to add uh, or to continue to use in this case. So just to do a quick recap, when choosing a product, you want to focus on active ingredients, right? It's mainly CBD and THC. You will see suppliers that also um, have CBN or CBG in there. Just know that the most studied are CBD and THC. And you don't necessarily have to pay particular attention to strains or species like indica or sativa. There's always this general claim that one species can do um, certain clinical effect where the other does a completely different one. Just know that these plants have been, you know, crossbred for, you know, millennia. So therefore, these botanical difference, differences may not be necessarily true. So you want to focus on CBD and THC. For cannabis naive patients, you want to start with a product that is CBD dominant, particularly a CBD dominant oil. And if patients failed several CBD dominant products, this is when you may incorporate products with more THC, of course, if there's no contraindication for THC. When you prescribe products, um, you want to prescribe products that can be easily dosed. So remember the ease of dosing that come with cannabis oils because it can be easily measured. Um, and of course, 
with using oils, the dose can be readily adjusted using very small increments. So the optimal dose, the likelihood of finding the optimal dose is much greater than if you were to use edibles or other routes of administration. Of course, we want to avoid inhalation routes because we know with inhalation routes, uh, there's respiratory adverse effects. But if uh, a patient insists or wants to go with inhalation, then vaping is much more safer than smoking. And when choosing suppliers, it's very important to choose a reliable one that has consistent supply. Remember that cannabis is an unregulated industry, and so therefore there might be poor quality control. So one product may be completely different than another, even though they would have the same, for instance, CBD dose or the same THC dose. So it's very important to stick with uh, one supplier and one company so that you don't get any sort of um, differences in clinical effect. And then when reviewing interactions, it's very important to sort of assess the clinical relevance. Uh, just because there may be an interaction, it doesn't mean that the medical cannabis is contraindicated in this case. It may simply just require dose adjustments um, in order to sort of mitigate the effect. Thank you. This concludes the presentation. And uh, I'll be uh, I'll be happy to take on any questions. Thank you, Mahmoud, for that excellent presentation. Yeah. No worries. I don't see any questions immediately. Um, Maybe I'll ask you one. I, uh, I'm not sure if this was included earlier, but there was a question about liver burden. And I, I'm wondering if there's any specific dose in adults that would be a kind of threshold for concern about liver burden among generally uh, otherwise healthy individuals. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good question. So, and this is the reason why you would want to sort of start at a very, very low dose um, and then titrate up slowly. For patients who have um, certain liver diseases or liver conditions, definitely you'd want to um, you know, cap the, the cannabis dose. Um, we know that cannabis is generally metabolized in the liver. So for patients who have, for instance, end-state liver disease or issues with liver, cannabis therapy may not be particularly appropriate in this case. For someone who has healthy livers, no issues, or mildly reduced liver function, um, in that case, you would probably want to be doing either monthly or even e monitoring every three months of liver enzymes just to see, make sure that um, there hasn't been any sort of um, significant elevation in, in enzymes. And in that case, you can carry on. You can ask the patient to carry on with titration. Um, if they found a stable dose, and they're monitoring their liver enzymes, and you see no change, then, then cannabis therapy in that case would be appropriate for them to sort of continue. Thank you. All right, seeing no other questions, let's yeah. wrap up here. Thank you very much for this presentation, and my apologies to the group for the technical difficulties, and my apologies to, to Dr. Siam, because those technical difficulties were on my end, not on his end. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I look forward to seeing participants at the conference live tomorrow. And thank you again, Dr. Siam. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Well. All right. Bye now.